Dutch forests and timber production. My name is Fritz Moren. I'm professor of forest ecology and forest management at Wageningen University, and I will give you a very brief introduction on uh, Dutch forests, how they are managed, and to what extent they are used for timber production. Basically, this presentation falls into three parts. First, the forest in the Netherlands, then forest management for multiple use, how we do forest management and silviculture, uh, and third, the production of sawwood and construction timber. If we look at forest globally, just for the overall picture, then there is about 4 billion hectares of forest, um, which is covering about 30% of the land surface. And in the picture, we already see that the biggest forest areas are in Russia, in uh, Brazil, and in Canada, with also very big parts in Central Africa, in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Other than that, you see big parts that have um, virtually no forest at all, largely climate determined. If we then zoom into Europe, then we see here a picture of the forest distribution over the uh, European landscape. Um, there is about 182 million hectares of forest covering 43% of the area. And again, most of the forests are in the northeastern part and in Scandinavia. And already here we can see that in the Netherlands there is actually very little forest to be seen. This is based on remote sensing uh, imagery. Um, and uh, we see that we have, compared to other countries, very little, also compared to the average value. Let's look a bit at the Dutch forest area, 373,000 hectares, which is about 11% of the land surface area, um, which is very, um, very little, in fact. There is, the history of this is, of course, that we have a, a rather densely populated country that was deforested long time ago for agricultural purposes. And we see here that basically the forest is remaining in the, uh, the central part, in the Veluwe area, uh, partly in the Utrechtse Heuvelrug in the province of Utrecht, and um, patches in the province of Drenthe, uh, in Brabant, Limburg, and also in Overijssel. We see very little forest in the western part of the country, and the reason for that is basically that this originally was marshland, so there was no forest growing there, or only very little. This history of agricultural use um, also is reflected in the soil conditions. Forests are confined largely to the poor sandy soils um, that were not very successful or not very useful for agriculture. Here you can see this in a, in a, a very general overview of the soil fertility um, in the Netherlands, and the yellow and red parts are the poorer soils. So forest was largely confined to the areas that were not very profitable for agriculture. If we look at the history of the forest, it's interesting to look at the changes in the forest area uh, in the Netherlands. Here we see um, a picture that uh, indicates the forests that are newly established since 1900. Um, in green, the blue is the forest that was already forest in 1900 and still is forest, and red are the areas that have been deforested since 1900. Since a uh, very long time, since medieval times, there has been very strong deforestation for agricultural purposes, as I mentioned, and as, as uh, uh, about 150 years ago, we only had 1 to 2 percent of forest remaining. And then gradually there was afforestation being done again, notably uh, around 1900 and in the 1920s and 30s, when heathlands were um, uh, afforested um, in order to make them profitable or useful for um, timber production. So the history of much of our forest is afforestation of rather poor, dry areas uh, with the aim to make them productive for uh, silviculture for forestry. The reason that these soils are rather poor, apart from their physical um, and chemical conditions, is also that they were impoverished by grazing. 
the system that was used for a very long time um, was um, sheep and cattle herding outside the villages and the cattle were then uh, and the sheep were then brought into the the sheds and the manure that was left in the sheds was spread out over the agricultural land around the villages but the grazing areas were at a longer distance and were simply impoverished by concentrating the nutrients um, through the manure of the animals around the villages and this typically led to the development of plug and soils which are uh, very typical for this northwest European large northwest European area and a lot of these um, areas that were used in this way developed into heathlands which were then called wastelands or barren soils that were then subsequently um, replanted um, about a hundred years ago This is a, an example of a, a typical land, heathland landscape that, was, uh, that originates from this sheep grazing uh, in the past. Now we're trying to preserve some of these heathlands uh, and uh, the, again sheep grazing is used for this. So the history of a lot of our forest land is poor sandy soils that were degraded um, in the past and then were uh, subsequently afforested. This is another example of the heathlands that, uh, and wastelands, in fact, with blowing sand that developed in the central part of the Veluwe near Kootwijk. So this is a typical picture um, where evidently the, uh, the area is very poor, there is very little uh, biological production, and there is a lot of uh, blowing sand. Overall, if we look at an historical perspective, um, forests worldwide have been cleared to make space for agriculture and this is still ongoing although uh, we, uh, we try and slow this uh, deforestation for agricultural purposes. In Western Europe this was already uh, going on in medieval times and there was a lot of deforestation uh, that took place around that time and gradually um, uh, afforestation uh, came about about a hundred years ago. So the forest coverage in the Netherlands was very low 150 years ago and then uh, increased again since then. These afforestations were done with uh, pioneer species such as Scotch pine um, and we see an example of this. So uh, a, a large part of the forest in the Netherlands has its origin in afforestations of wastelands with uh, species like Scotch pine. These were not very productive stand, stands and it took, uh, it took the trees a long time to grow to uh, somewhat bigger dimensions. Also, the wood quality was not very high simply because the quality of the stems, the stems were not straight, they had lots of branches and, were, and, and delivered knotty um, wood products with a lot of knots in them. Gradually, these Scotch pine stands have been replaced by um, by other species. Uh, and this is an example of a Douglas fir stand that was then uh, planted in the 50s or 60s in order to increase the productivity. Gradually, after this afforestation, there was buildup of organic material in the soil. There was a gradual buildup of um, a more intensive nutrient cycling and the productivity of the sites increased. And then species that were more productive, such as Douglas fir, could be used. Still, this was basically for timber production uh, and we have a, a quite a bit of D Douglas fir stands now that have big dimensions and, and that also can deliver good quality saw timber. The forests that were already the forest or that remain forest uh, in, uh, in many different places in our country uh, developed into deciduous forests, for example beech forest and those are the typical old growth or old forest that we have where there is a quite a big, big high biodiversity value and there is also uh, a quite nice scenic value and so the forests uh, are very attractive to visit and walk in but again as you can see here the wood quality is not very high uh, and there is very little saw timber coming from this type of uh, forest gradually these um, uh, these coniferous stands um, were transformed into mixed uh, stands where coniferous trees and deciduous trees are mixed 
and our country is typically in the beech area. In the, beech is typically a tree species that plays a very important role. If we don't do anything in the forest, it will gradually over, over the decades and over the centuries turn into a beech forest. And here we can see some examples of this. Beech does give a fairly good wood quality, but it's not very uh, suitable for larger constructions. Therefore, oak is much more valuable. And we have some oak in the Netherlands, but not that much. Trees take a lot of time to grow. And if you want saw wood, you need big dimensions, which means that it takes a long time before such uh, dimensions um, are available for harvesting. And it also very much depends on the way the forest is treated. Um, when forests are planted, they usually are planted in very, uh, were planted in very high densities, like 3,000 trees or 4,000 trees per hectare. And um, when the trees grow, they gradually start to compete and suppress each other. And what was done in the past um, and still is done today, thinning management is used to reduce the number of trees and to concentrate the timber on the, the, the wood growth, uh, on the valuable trees that are then in the final harvest. And here you can see the, um, how, this is, how this works. Trees make a layer of timber, um, a layer of wood every year, and uh, you can see a pattern of annual growth rings developing depending on the density of the stand. If a stand is not thinned, then in the beginning it grows just like any other stand, uh, but then gradually the growth rings are smaller and smaller simply because there are so many trees per hectare and the productivity per hectare is relatively independent of density, is relatively constant. So when the trees are uh, gradually thinned and more um, wood production, more wood is concentrated on fewer stems, then uh, the growth rings remain fairly large and the trees can, can become quite big. This is an example in Sitka spruce, where you don't have much Sitka spruce, but it's just to illustrate the, the principle of thinning. Thinning is necessary if stands are planted at high densities. If stands are planted at low densities, then uh, the trees become, uh, have very big branches. And then this is another aspect of wood quality that is unwanted if you want to have construction timber. So the best thing to do is to have gradual thinning where the trees grow and uh, can develop in length and can grow regularly in diameter. Typically in forest research, there is all sorts of experiments of densities of uh, how, uh, how these planted stands uh, can be treated best to uh, give good productivity and good wood quality. And this is an example of an, uh, an old thinning experiment where there is no thinning on the left and there is a uh, uh, little thinning in the middle and there is a substantial strong thinning so uh, more trees are taken out on the right and if there is heavy thinning then the remaining trees can grow to big dimensions which makes them also more um, suitable for saw timber as i said you can see this pattern this growth pattern reflected in the annual growth rings and this to a large extent also determines the wood quality the wood quality uh, for saw timber for construction purposes is determined by the, uh, by the buildup of growth rings, to what extent they are regular, because the growth rings determine the mechanical uh, properties and the me mechanical uh, uh, strength of the timber, and also by the branchiness. So it is advantageous to have small branches that are shed early on um, during the development of the tree, uh, when the crown rises, when the tree becomes bigger and the crown rises to the upper part of the canopy. So that is stimulated by a higher density. And then when the trees have reached the upper, uh, upper canopy, then the principle is, is that thinning uh, gives room for the trees to become uh, thicker, to, to become, to get. This is illustrated here. Um, Thinning determines growing space and the shape of the stem, and thus thinning and, and stand management, which we call silviculture, I'll come back to that, uh, determines also the wood quality. This is an example um, of trees that are of oak trees that are 100 years old. Um, the first one is a, a typical shape of a freestanding oak tree with heavy branches and a big, large crown, a broad crown, and also a very long crown. 
but only a small part of the stem that um, has um, good quality for construction timber. The second example here is a tree that has grown up in a dense stand, hence is very thin, has thin growth rings and has only a small crown. The third example is a tree that has grown up in coppice with standards, which is a specific uh, management system that was used in the past where there is uh, where the trees around a, a small number of large trees per hectare are cut regularly and can regrowth, but only a few trees are allowed to grow to bigger dimensions. And the fourth example is uh, an oak that has grown up uh, in uh, an oak forest that was regularly thinned uh, and that was thinned to um, favor the future crop trees that then grow to big dimensions. And this is the typical oak um, system, oak management system that delivers high quality. But it takes a long time. These uh, oak trees now here are 100 years old, but the typical rotation, so the, the age at which oak, oak trees of big dimensions can be harvested is more like 250 or 300 years. So this is a very long term process. This is an example of an oak tree from a coppice system with standards. Uh, so this is uh, so here you can very nicely see that on the branching pattern of a tree you can see how it has uh, um, grown up. This tree evidently has been able to make very big branches when it was rather young, when it was rather small, and has developed a really big crown because it was freestanding in uh, uh, in an area that was otherwise regularly cut. So what I've been basically saying here is that silviculture, and silviculture is the art of how you thin stands, how you tend a forest stand, a forest ecosystem um, to achieve certain objectives. This can be timber production, but it can also be other uh, ecosystem um, functions, uh, other um, objectives. Silviculture is basically the, the way we treat our forest, the way we treat the stand. Effectively, this is applied ecology. It combines general knowledge uh, with practical experience and then applies this in local conditions. Um, typically, forestry is a combination of general knowledge and experience. Because of these very long time spans, we cannot always rely on measurements of these stands, of, of the, the systems that we're interested in, simply because these measurements are not available. There is very little experimental plots that um, have been measured over a hundred years. There are some in Germany. Uh, our first plots have been measured in the uh, in the 1920s. So it's also almost a hundred years. But these are very few. So there is always uh, the need to rely on experience from local foresters and that also know the local conditions. Basically, the way forests are managed and this holds for even aged plantations as well as for uh, uneven age stands that have been developed from natural processes is very strongly based on natural processes. We want to use nature um, to achieve the objectives uh, of the owner or the forest manager. In general, this is called close to nature forestry, but this is a specific uh, term. This management, um, of course, has to, needs to have a long term perspective, which is very complicated because uh, it's not so easy or even impossible to know which type of forest we would like to have in 50 or 100 years from now. Um, at the moment, for example, as a, this is a typical um, uh, example, there is quite a lot of interest in carbon storage in forests. Uh, but this was not the case 40 years ago. Then nobody was interested in carbon storage. Then we were interested in timber production or in biodiversity conservation. So the, the the, the demand on forest is changing much faster than the forest stand itself. And this makes it, it difficult for a forest manager to keep a long-term perspective, to keep a perspective that allows different forest use by society in the long run. Now, it's interesting to see how this, uh, the way we, we deal with our forest has changed over the years, over the decades. Um, if we look back, 50 years from now, then basically in the middle of the last century, the emphasis was very much on timber production. And this holds until 1970, approximately. 
Uh, and this timber production was simply uh, to use the land, especially these uh, what was previously considered wastelands, for some sort of production purpose. This is why these scotch pines were planted and gradually they were replaced by uh, more demanding and more um, um, productive uh, other species such as uh, Douglas fir. So the emphasis until about 1970 was very much on timber production. Uh, the forest was considered uh, a forest for production. Uh, the professional label was forestry and uh, there was not much uh, talk about ecosystem services. Ecosystem services is a concept that came up in the uh, about a 30 years ago uh, to reflect the, the much more broader interest in the functions or the roles that ecosystems uh, such as forests play in society nowadays. So if we think about ecosystem services, then the emphasis until about 1970 was fully on uh, production. Uh, around 1970, there was a, a big development uh, and much more interest in nature conservation uh, developed. This was invoked by public awareness uh, of environmental problems, of pollution and so on. And also um, it, it became aware there was an uh, increasing need to protect biodiversity. So uh, in, since, 19, since about 1970 until, let's say, 2000, there was a, a strong increase in the interest in biodiversity conservation and we don't talk about uh, uh, timber production that much anymore but we very much consider uh, forest and nature together uh, and the the way we use the forest uh, is for multifunctionality so for more different for different purposes yeah, so we have we talk about multifunctional forest and nature areas the professionals um, are still very much associated with forestry, um, but in terms of ecosystem services, um, even though they were not called that, like that in the 70s, uh, the emphasis uh, shifts from timber production only to timber production plus regulating services such as biodiversity conservation. Since uh, about 2000, um, uh, we very much focus on ecosystem management, which means that we don't uh, focus on the production of timber and on biodiversity conservation as a secondary uh, target, but we very much look at um, how we can manage the ecosystem to accommodate different wishes from society, such as biodiversity conservation, but also um, recreational purposes, uh, regulating services in terms of carbon storage and so on. So then the ecosystem services really cover a wide range of goods and services. And um, the, the management is very much um, determined by what is biologically possible based on the stands that we have and based on the sites that we are dealing with and the needs from society. So there has been a big shift from timber production before 1970 to uh, what we're trying to do now, uh, which is managing uh, the forest, managing the forest ecosystem um, for biodiversity conservation, for um, ecosystem services such as production and carbon storage and so on. And it very much depends on an individual owner or the management agency uh, that is responsible for the management where the emphasis is. And of course, it also depends on what society really wants, huh? whether, whether we can afford to uh, import our timber from abroad and um, have, um, have biodiversity conservation as the main target or whether we also need some economic aspects, uh, some economic uh, gains by selling timber. Also, the forest has gradually changed. Um, I talked about these plantation forests, uh, which is basically an ex extreme example. It was not plantation forest on the entire area, um, but gradually there was an interest in small scale regeneration and not in planting, but, but in using uh, natural regeneration and in developing more complex stand structures. For example, uh, for biodiversity conservation, because biodiversity conservation is very much linked to uh, a, a, a horizontal and vertical uh, variation in forest structure and also uh, in buildup of organic uh, material. So um, we gradually moved from a, uh, from a simple, let's say agricultural timber production system to a more mixed stance, uh, uneven aged, where all sorts of other aspects play a role. 
and quite often the regeneration, the, the young trees are not planted anymore, but they simply uh, the natural regeneration that is uh, occurring at a certain place is uh, being used. If we look at um, the forest, in the interest in forest and forestry in the Netherlands, then you could say that um, basically all of us, um, 70 million people are interested in recreational use. If, if people are asked what they like most in their free time, then forest, visiting the forest or visiting the beach, but mainly visiting the forest is uh, uh, on top of the list. A lot of people also realize that forest is very important for biodiversity conservation. Forest is an important uh, carrier of biodiversity um, in, in our landscape, which is heavily used by agriculture and is also strongly urbanized. So in terms of nature conservation, maybe 3 million people as an estimate um, are interested in forest. But then if we look at timber production, even though many people like to have wood in their environment, uh, in their houses, and like wood as a as a as a natural material, the the production function of forest is actually um, not that much valued. Uh, um, and um, many people think we should buy our timber from abroad. So I put a number of ten thousand here, but this is of course just an order of magnitude to show that the recreational function and the uh, nature conservation uh, function of forest is at least as important as the timber production function in the in the Netherlands. And this, of course, you could simply summarize by saying um, with only a small forest area and with many people in an urbanized society, recreational use and nature conservation perhaps overrule timber production in large parts of our forest, which is in fact also the case. There is quite a large area in the Netherlands, maybe uh, between 20 and 30 percent, which is not used for uh, for harvesting at all, and based and effectively in all in, in the on the whole forest area, the combination of forest functions um, is important in what we call then integrated forest management. So we're always trying to consider what is uh, uh, what is the purpose uh, uh, in this area? Is it uh, what role plays timber production? Uh, how important is nature conservation? How important is recreational? use and how important is carbon storage, which is a new forest function. So let's, let's look at some of the, uh, of the numbers of the total amount of timber use and timber production in the Netherlands. Uh, typically, and this holds all over the world, the timber use uh, is about one cubic meter um, per person per year. Uh, for the Netherlands, this means that we use about 16 or 17 million cubic meters in total. And this one cubic meter wood use per person per year is, is all, basically the same all over the world. In the tropics, this is more, uh, is, is, half of it is fuel wood. Um, in our uh, countries, the fuel wood component is, is much less. But in general, this is the total amount of timber that is uh, being used per person per year and 16 million for uh, the Netherlands in total. The annual growth rate of our forest of these uh, 373,000 hectares is about 2.7 million cubic meters. Annual growth is important because uh, this is typically an aspect of sustainability. Eh? You should not harvest more than the annual growth rate. Um, and in fact, the harvest is less. But you can already see here that the annual growth rate that can um, uh, that can be used, that could, that could be used for timber uh, harvesting is much less than the total demand, the total use in the Netherlands. And actually the um, actual harvest is about half of the annual growth rate. And this is because we harvest much less than what is would be potentially possible because our forests are still in a build-up phase. Uh, we like our forests to get older with bigger dimension, bigger trees. And also, as, as I mentioned before, there's about 20-30% is not being used for harvesting at all. Um, so effectively, of these 373,000 hectares, uh, maybe 60% is being, um, uh, has a, a, some role as, for, as timber production and is being harvested. So the total annual harvest is about half of the annual growth and there is still, our forest is still accumulating biomass, accumulating timber and accumulating carbon. But you can see that the actual uh, uh, supply to the market and to the, uh, the, the national use is only 60, uh, uh, is only 10% of the 
of the demand. So production, uh, local production or national production covers about 10% of the, of the demand. And as a result, we uh, rely quite heavily on imported timber. The fact that we rely on imported timber, of course, for us for a small country with very little forest, is um, is is not necessarily a problem. Why should you be self-sufficient in timber uh, supply if you only have very little forest? If we look at saw timber, which is of course only uh, a part of the annual growth and of the um, annual uh, harvest, then we see that production, so the the national harvest, is about a 133 thousand cubic meters. These are 2018 figures. Uh, and you can find the figures on the websites uh, indicated below. Uh, and of this production, um, about 60%, 65% is conifers and um, uh, one third is broadleaves of, of uh, 45%. That means that effectively, uh, most of the saw timber is imported as you can see here, and also this is mainly conifer imports and a little bit broadleaf. We also do some exports um, um, of um, uh, mainly of conifer timber. But you can see here that the saw timber that is coming from our own forest is only a very small fraction of the total demand. Now, when we come to the supply, uh, there is also um, the issue that our forests are relatively young, so have smaller dimensions, and which means that there is not really a market, there has not really developed a market for, um, for Dutch saw timber. Since uh, some 20 years, the forest cooperatives uh, organize an auction every year in February, where they sell about a hundred, uh, uh, about a, a thousand cubic meters uh, high quality or more or less high quality um, timber from uh, Dutch forest owners um, uh, as, as a means to organize a market to get uh, decent uh, revenues for saw timber or for high quality timber. But, but again, this is only for 1000 cubic meters. So this is even a, a, a very small um, amount, in fact. Now, the interesting issue is, and, and this is, I believe, also what uh, uh, is being discussed by architects and by, uh, by, uh, by the building sector, is how can we increase the use of timber in our building activities? Because there is good reasons for using more timber in buildings. It's a very nice building material. Uh, you may store uh, carbon by uh, using timber in buildings and so on. But then the question is, where does it come from? These are two examples of, um, of uh, more or less recently established buildings. The Triodos Bank, Bank building in Driebergen is very new and is uh, beautifully uh, constructed using um, uh, uh, very good quality timber. And uh, on the left is the Lumen building of Wageningen University, which is actually the building that my office is in, um, and which is also uh, uh, constructed with national timber. Um, what we see here is that, um, uh, the, uh, I believe in the Triodosbank, most of the timber was imported in the, the building of the, uh, of the looming building. Um, there were new techniques in which uh, also smaller pieces of timber can be used for larger constructions. Uh, and, and of course, not uh, the main construction is made from timber, but from uh, 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 concrete and steel. So for timber production uh, in Dutch forest related to the use of uh, timber as building materials, we should think that trees take a long time to grow to large dimensions. Our forest is relatively young, so we have very uh, relatively little high quality timber in our forest stands. So the, uh, only a small amount can be uh, supplied to meet the demands from, from industry. And the forest area in the Netherlands is small. Um, there's good reasons to enlarge it, uh, uh, not only timber production, but also biodiversity conservation uh, and carbon storage. Uh, but we still have a small forest area, which also means that the amount of timber that can be supplied from this area is relatively small. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, the Dutch forests are managed in a multifunctional way. 
in which we try to integrate timber production, nature conservation, recreational use, and also carbon storage. And that simply means that uh, uh, an owner or a management agency may give preference to nature conservation rather than to timber production, because that is uh, an ecosystem service that uh, either their members or the owner um, um, values most. I mentioned the smaller dimensions of the uh, saw timber uh, coming from uh, the Dutch forest. It takes a long time to develop the forest that uh, there are larger dimensions uh, of trees coming out. But there is lots of technological innovations that currently allow to use smaller dimensions. One of them is CLT, cross laminated timber, in which smaller dimensions are glued together to make panels that, that can, then can be used in an industrial way. What is also important is that local and national markets are small if they are available at all. Uh, and that means that the full potential of the timber quality that is being harvested is not always used. So there is certainly uh, a development possible there. Now, just to wrap up, uh, there is a lot of uh, professional institutions that uh, uh, are dealing with these issues and this <clears throat> integration of production, biodiversity conservation, recreational use, carbon storage is, is typically at the heart of management considerations of the larger management agencies such as the State Forest Service, also nature monuments and private forest owners. Um, there is all sorts of professional and uh, uh, um, uh, and management networks. There is a, an association of forest and nature um, owners. There is a an association that uh, deals with uh, uh, national produced timber. Um, there is a, a professional association of forest managers, which is called the Dutch Forestry Association. And I mentioned already the forest cooperatives, the Bosgroepen, that uh, organize the work for uh, private forest owners. And there is various research and education institutions, Wageningen University, Larestein, which is the uh, professional level uh, education institution, uh, and also others like Probos, the Foundation for Wood Research, and also the, uh, the Technical University in Delft has a department or a group that deals with wood technology, and there are more other, uh, uh, many others. So there, there is lots of discussion on how to manage forests, uh, where to place the emphasis and what sort of ecosystem services should take priority. But again, I would like to remind you that uh, these forests have a long-term pers uh, uh, perspective, um, have a long-term um, growth cycle. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it is important to, to try and combine things and, uh, and, and uh, prepare for the future in a sustainable way. Finally, at the end, I would like to, for those of you that um, want to look more into this, uh, there is a Dutch textbook we produced some years ago, um, which is called uh, Forest Ecology and Forest Management, um, uh, which was produced in 2010. Um, there is an, a nice website of uh, a colleague from practice, boslesser.nl, that gives you information on how forests are managed. And if you have any specific uh, further questions, don't hesitate to contact me through email. Thank you.